A very good morning to Dr. Anand Sashitanadan, consultant cardiothoracic surgeon, Dr. Chua Kyung Tiong, consultant physician and respiratory physician, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining us and welcome to the very first Star Life session of 2019. My name is Julianne from Star Media Group and we're really excited to see everyone here today. And now before we begin, allow me to share with you what Star Life is all about. As a way of connecting with our readers, Star Media Group presents an exciting array of talk sessions covering various topical matters of interest, from guides to leading a healthier lifestyle to meet and greet sessions with personalities. Our guest speakers for today's Star Life session are Dr. Anand and Dr. Chua Kyung Tiong. Let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> Lung cancer, traditionally a disease affecting male smokers, now affect many, many non-smokers and women as well. Now, most people would think that lung cancer is among one of the most deadly cancers with no chance of survival. But that's not all true. Today, our guest speakers will be sharing with us everything you need to know about lung cancer, from understanding the symptoms to the latest treatments available. Ladies and gentlemen, at the end of the session, there will be a Q&A opportunity with our guest speakers. Before we begin the talk session, just a few housekeeping rules. Please do switch your phone on silent mode and reserve any question that you might have for the Q&A session after the talk. We'd like to remind you that no food and drinks are allowed within the auditorium. And now, without further ado, let's welcome Dr. Anand to the stage to shed light on the latest local statistics and provide a practical guide on how to navigate lung cancer. Thank you, Julia. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's wonderful to see a very good turnout here this morning. Uh, thank you to SJMC and to Star for kindly hosting this uh, session. So um, I think my remit here in the next 30, 40 minutes is to try and share with you um, the scale of the problem of lung cancer here in Malaysia. Can you hear me? Yeah. And uh, I will try and take you through some of the local data, statistics that is relevant for all of us here in Malaysia as well as share with you some of the important concepts in terms of lung cancer and on the importance of screening. So um, we've titled this talk as The War on Lung Cancer, and it really is a battle of sorts. So um, a bit of basic statistics. Um, this is a statistical fact of life. This is local Malaysian data. For each and every one of us here in the room, uh, the lifetime risk of developing a cancer of any sort before the age of 75 is approximately one in 10 if you're a man and slightly higher at one in nine if you're a woman. Now much of the data that I'm going to share with you, and I know data is boring, but it's important that we have a sense of perspective to know the scale of the problem of lung cancer because we're not talking about some rare, obscure, unusual syndrome or disease. We're talking about quite a common disease and a disease that kills. So a lot of the data that I'm going to share with you comes from the, our own National Cancer Registry. And um, that was published. The most contemporary data we have is for the years 2007 to 2011. And also I'll be sharing with you a bit more data from the uh, statistics in terms of longer term survival. So if we have a look at the commonest cancers here in Malaysia, and this is the most up-to-date statistics that we have available. It's freely available on the internet. Uh, we can see that um, lung cancer here in yellow uh, ranks overall as number three. That's if you put male and female together. It's the third commonest, and it accounts for about 10% of all cancers. But if we look a little bit further, and we stratify into male and female, we can see that in men, in Malaysian men, it is the commonest cancer, or I say the commonest, it's the joint number one. Uh, Lung cancer accounts for 15.8% of all cancers in Malaysian men. So it's up there with colon cancer, marginally higher at 16.4%. In women, it's the fifth commonest cancer, as you can see, with an incidence of about 5.6% in terms of cancer uh, prevalence. Commonest, of course, in women being breast cancer. So I hope the first point to get across is we're dealing with a fairly common disease. Joint number one cancer in men, fifth commonest in women. 
If we look a little bit more at the demographics, this looks at what is referred to as the age-specific incidence rate. And we can see, this is um, the age groups here in the middle, and you can see that the incidence per 100,000 members of the population increases in this age group, which, uh, which I guess is quite intuitive as well. As we all get older, the risk of developing any disease, particularly a malignancy, a cancerous process, does increase. And the peak age of incidence starts to rise over the age of 45, and obviously as we get older, it increases. In fact, slightly older data that we have suggests the incidence of lung cancer in Malaysians under the age of 40 is only around 6.2%. So we may all know of someone, or know of someone who knows of someone who's had lung cancer who is much younger, those cases do happen, unfortunately, but in the vast majority, uh, it would be over the age of 40 or 45. Now, the next slide that I want to share with you, this one, as far as I'm concerned, if you remember one slide from this talk this morning, please remember this one. So to me, this is the, the most um, critical statistic that I have to share with you. So what we have here, again, sorry for the uh, stereotyping, but men are in blue and women are in red. And what this, again, is our own national data, Malaysian data. And we can see that uh, at the time of initial diagnosis, so when a person is first diagnosed, they've been to their GP, then they've seen various specialists, and they have now been diagnosed with lung cancer, at that what we call as an initial presentation, only 3% or 4%, in women it's 3%, in males it's 4%. So only 3 to 4% of such individuals are in stage one, about 7% stage two, and the overwhelming majority, 89 to 91%, nine out of 10 cases at the time of initial diagnosis, initial presentation to the doctor, these individuals are in stages three and four. So very often we get asked, and I apologize sometimes when we use medical jargon, but the stage of a disease, this is applicable to any cancer, not just the lung cancer, the stage in simple terms refers to the extent of spread. In layman's terms, stage equates to the extent of spread. And we use a complex system called TNM uh, through a whole array of investigations, various scans, some invasive procedures, to arrive at the accurate staging of lung cancer for any individual patient. And with any cancer, and especially with lung cancer, the stage is critical because the stage of the disease will determine what is the most appropriate treatment that should be offered to that individual patient. And that in turn will determine their prognosis, which means the outcome. So lung cancer, broadly speaking, has four stages. We've got stage one, stage two, stage three, and stage four. Now, I've simplified it. It's actually a little bit more complex. There are subgroups of stage 1A, 1B, 2A, 2B, stage 3A, 3B, 3C, and stage 4A and 4B. Now, this is an international classification that is used across the world um, so that when doctors uh, discuss cases, you can bring your scans from one hospital or from one country to another reports, and it is a common language that we speak. So, Generally speaking, the earlier stage disease, the better the outcome. We know that in terms of survival, we know that in terms of response to treatment. So what I wanna highlight at this early point in the talk is that um, at initial presentation, nine out of 10 patients in Malaysia who are diagnosed with lung cancer have effectively missed the boat. We're picking it up too late in stages three and four. Stage three, and four is what we call as locally advanced disease. The tumor that originated in the lung has now spread to other parts of the lung. Perhaps it is spread to the lymph nodes that we all have in our chest or thoracic cavity. As with any cancer, it can spread through a process that is known as metastasis. Either the tumor breaks off and travels through the lymphatic system or through our bloodstream, and it can travel to a distant site, a faraway site. And that is usually what we see in stage four and that is called metastatic disease. And the common sites where lung cancer can metastasize to are usually um, the brain or the bone or to the opposite lung. Um, patients may also develop, for example, fluid around the lung that is called a pleural effusion. So as we move along, um, the other 
source of information that I need to acknowledge is the MyScan data. This was published by our National Cancer Registry Department. And the MyScan data came out uh, sometime last year. So quite nice that we actually have quite robust, up-to-date local data that is applicable to us as Malaysians, as opposed to having to always rely on data from Australia or the US or UK, because our demographics are different. The age group, the ethnicity is different from Western populations, and we cannot always just extrapolate the findings in UK or US. So when we look at uh, this table refers to survival. So before we look at this slide, again, I'm sure many of you are familiar with the concept of a five-year survival. So if any of you have had to see a doctor or an oncologist or have a discussion for yourself or your family members, all cancer outcomes, be it lung cancer or any cancer, is quantified in terms of a five-year survival. So if someone said the five-year survival is 80%, what they mean is if we took 100 people now in 2018 and they were diagnosed with, say, for example, stage one lung cancer, and they were told they have a five-year survival of 80%, it means with the best available treatment, and if you followed that person up in five years' time, which would be 2023, 20, 80 from that original group of 100 will still be alive. 20 would have passed on, quite likely from the cancerous disease, sometimes due to something else. What nobody can predict, though, it doesn't mean that those people only live for five years. They may, the, the 80 that have survived for five years may go on to live another 20, 30 years, for example. Similarly, if you say there's a five-year survival of 10%, that tells you that in five years from the diagnosis, nine out of 10, or 90 out of the 100 who were diagnosed would be dead. So when we look, so that is, again, a common nomenclature in trying to quantify outcomes for lung cancer or any cancer. It's a measurable outcome. It's an imperfect statistic, but it's very helpful to quantify outcomes in terms of survival. And you can see that lung cancer is down here. Basically, lung cancer is bottom of the Premier League table, okay, in terms of cancer outcomes. It, it is not a good cancer to have. Sounds like a silly thing to say, I guess no cancer is a good one to have, but perhaps only pancreatic cancer fares worse. And why is that? It's largely due to the fact that it's being picked up too late in the vast majority. I told you two slides ago that nine out of 10 people here in Malaysia were picking up the disease in stages three and four. And late stage equates with a worse outcome. So this slide demonstrates that out of 8,000 odd cases they analyzed, um, we can see that they had uh, complete staging data, full information in about 60% of cases. And we can see over here, it's called a five-year relative survival, and just concentrate in stage one. Still quite poor, 37%, but just as we move across to the right, I hope you can all see that, and if you come across to stage four, the five-year survival diminishes to 6.3%. So that's horrible, that's horrendous. Um, perhaps this graphic just reiterates the point I've made, easier to, to look at. Again, we have stage, this is all lung cancer in Malaysians, local data, stage one, two, three, and four. And in the bright pink is the one year survival. And in the purple is the five year survival. And again, just looking at the graphs or looking at these bar charts, it is quite apparent that if you had to have lung cancer, look at the outcomes there. Although they are still not fabulous, they are markedly better for stage one disease than compared to stage three disease. So we've got now a situation where we're dealing with a common cancer and a common cancer killer. We're picking it up too late, and the later stage disease is associated with a worse outcome. Um, in Malaysia, of course, we love to analyze everything, every, everything through the prism of race. And uh, in their data, they've also looked at ethnicity. Um, and you can see, again, we've got the Malay, Chinese, and Indian groups. And again, just very broad statistics, but it appears that uh, those of Indian ethnicity have a slightly better outcome. Now, what this tells us is that we know that, as with most diseases, and certainly with most cancers, there is a genetic predisposition and as a general statement, we know that uh, if you're of Chinese ethnicity, 
you have almost twice the risk of developing a lung cancer once we adjust for your age or your gender. So we know there's a genetic predisposition for a lot of cancers, including lung cancer. Finally, I want to just, uh, before we move on to the next bit, how does Malaysia, how do we compare regionally or globally, right? It's always important to benchmark our outcomes or our statistics. And this is an international comparison, fairly contemporary, published in 2018, looking at the relative survival over five years. And this is for lung cancer. Now this looks at all stages, stage one right across to stage four. And you can see in countries, developed nations, our East Asian neighbors in Japan and Korea, their overall five-year survival is considerably better, almost 30% in Japan. They're way ahead of us. In Korea, 20%. Even in North America, 20%. And uh, even in, in somewhere like Singapore, where we all often assume that they are very, very developed and sophisticated, not so great, only about 13%. And in the Asia Pacific region and a few Western European countries, Malaysia is near the bottom. Only India seems to fare worse. So this is looking at the five year survival of all comers. And what this tells us is that um, why our five year survival is only 11%. That means if you take all Malaysian patients diagnosed with lung cancer from stage one through to stage four, we put them all together and we follow up, the five year survival is 11%. So that's dismal. That means out of a group of 100, only 11 will be alive in five years' time, statistically. And the reason for that is because the majority of people, as I said previously, are being diagnosed too late in stages three and four. And why do the Japanese and the Koreans have far better results? Because they are better at picking up the disease earlier. No cancer starts at stage four. Any cancerous process always starts at stage one. It's just that in the early stages, the disease there is often no, there are no signs or symptoms, and that's the difficulty in trying to detect the disease at an early stage. So, um, the summary of the first five or six slides is this. This is what we know. In Malaysia, we know that it's the leading cancer in Malaysian men. It's joint number one with colon cancer. 15.8% of all cancers in Malaysian men is attributable to lung cancer. And it's the number one cancer killer. Approximately one in four to one in five of all cancer deaths in Malaysian males is due to lung cancer. In women, it's the fifth commonest, right? 5.6% of all cancers in Malaysian women due to lung cancer. But even though it's number five, in terms of mortality as a cancer killer, only breast cancer kills more women. And 13% of all cancer deaths is attributable to lung cancer in women. The other important statistic, and uh, I don't apologize for repeatedly saying this, is that 90% of cases we are picking up in stages three and four, too late. And as you know, late stage diagnosis, late stage presentation, worse outcomes. The median survival is 6.8 months. Again, not a very pleasant thing to say on a Saturday morning, but that's the average survival time. 50% of people with lung cancer would live only for less than seven months, despite all the available treatments, again, because of the late stage disease. And um, overall, five year survival of 11%. I've also just summarized the other local data. What we know is outcomes are far better. We don't know why, if you have Indian ethnicity, as opposed to Malay or Chinese. Women tend to do a bit better than men. Younger patients tend to do better, perhaps for obvious reasons. And what is quite uh, well established globally is that early stage disease, stage one disease, um, is associated with a far better outcome. So again, this is taken from our National Cancer Society in infographic, just to summarize, joint number one really in men, fifth commonest in women, 90% being picked up in stages three and four. Um, my colleague, Dr. Chua, will be talking more about the signs and symptoms, so I won't go into that other than to say that in the early stages of lung cancer, unfortunately, there are no signs or symptoms. So a sign is what the doctor picks up on examination of the patient. A symptom is what the patient or the person will complain of. For example, coughing a lot, coughing up blood, having difficulty breathing, etc. But in the early stages, stages one and stages two, it is quite uncommon, quite rare for the individual to have symptoms. 
And unfortunately, by the time you develop symptoms, it's usually, not always, but it's often indicative of a more late stage, more advanced stage disease. Now, I just want to put this up to give you all a bit more knowledge. This is the staging for lung cancer. This is what doctors, oncologists, thoracic surgeons like myself, chest physicians like Dr. Chua have to deal with. This is, we arrive at the staging based on the various tests. It always starts off with a simple x-ray and then they need a CT scan, they may need a biopsy, they may need something called a PET scan. They may need various scopes and other procedures, some of which are invasive. The idea being to try and accurately stratify the patient, determine whether they have early or late stage disease. And it's an international thing referred to as the TNM. The T refers to the size of the tumor, but the size descriptor is just one parameter. We also look at the location of the tumor. The N refers to lymph nodes. So we all have a whole bunch of lymph nodes in our chest cavity called the mediastinum. And cancers do spread to the lymph nodes. And it depends whether the tumor has spread to the lymph nodes on one side of the chest or the other side of the chest. And they're different lymph nodes. So you can have something called N0, N1, N2, N3 disease. And the M stands for metastases, which means if they're spread, and even that is stratified, whether the spread is within the chest, outside the chest, and whether it's a single metastases or multiple. So for example, someone who had a lung cancer and it spread to the brain, that would automatically make that person uh, have M1B and it's stage four. So the, the staging is quite complex but it is essential because it, it, it is predictive or it underpins what treatment should be offered to the patient. There are certain treatments that are appropriate for certain stages. Early stage disease, stages one, 1A, 1B, stage two, 2A, 2B, and some cases of stage 3A, if the patient is fit enough, then the gold standard treatment unequivocally is an operation to remove the tumor which usually involves removing that part of the lung. Stage, most cases of stage 3A and stage 3B, there is almost no role for surgery. And with stage four, there are some rare exceptions. You may have a young patient who has a tumor that can be removed with one metastasis to the brain or to the bone that the neurosurgeon or the orthopedic surgeon says they can remove, and there are reasonable outcomes. But those cases are quite rare. In the vast majority, if you have stage four disease, Again, there's little or no role for surgery. So the goal of treatment shifts. In early stage disease, the goal of treatment, the doctor's duty and aim is curative. And the clue there is cure. We're trying to cure the patient by removing the tumor and the associated lymph nodes. And surgery is the treatment of choice, but it is done in the context of what we call as multi-modality. Meaning it is done in, in conjunction, the patient may need, for example, chemotherapy or radiotherapy or something called immunotherapy or something called targeted therapy. And it's quite complex. There's no one size fits all. Some patients need the treatment before surgery. We call that neoadjuvant therapy. Some require it after surgery and that is called adjuvant therapy. And then all patients need very close surveillance. So why I showed you the earlier slides about the stage of the disease and why I showed you that very complex slide here in terms of the varying stages is at the end of the day, this is what it translates to. This is international data from the International Association for the Study of Lung Cancer, where they pull together data from all over the world. And all I want you to look at is stage, stage 1A is the best case scenario. If you had to have a lung cancer and you were allowed to choose, you would choose, we would all choose stage 1A. And within that, it is stratified actually to 1A1, 1A2, 1A3 based on the actual size. So if that was what was destined for us and you had to have a lung cancer and you were allowed to choose, you would pick a stage 1A1. Why? Because look at the five year survival at 60 months, we can achieve a five year survival of 92%. Okay, which again may not sound impressive to some of you, but let me tell you that is fantastic. And as we go down the stages, to 1A2 and all the way down. And you can see, worst case scenario, stage 4B, look at the five year survival, zero. Look at even stage 3C, 3B, very, very dismal, poor outcomes. So again, this is to emphasize the importance of detection of the disease at an early stage. 
So I hope I have um, not convinced you, but I hope I have given you some updated insight into the scale of the problem, that we're dealing with a common cancer and a common cancer killer, that we're picking it up too late, that there is an effective treatment if you pick it up early, and early disease, early detection equates to better outcomes, better survival. So how do we pick up the disease earlier? Now we know that, um, as I said previously, in early stage disease, unfortunately, there are very few signs or symptoms. So then comes this concept of screening. So screening, the concept of screening, you're not even a patient, you're a person, right? You're just a normal person. And the concept is to detect the disease before the individual has developed the signs and symptoms. So they are at an asymptomatic or a preclinical stage. The concept for screening for lung cancer is not new. The Japanese have been doing it for 20, 30 years. They used to do it with old-fashioned chest x-ray and sputum cytology. You cough up your phlegm and they had to look for cancer cells. But over the decades, they found it was not cost effective. It wasn't sensitive enough. What's changed the whole landscape is two major trials that have been published. This one, take it from me, is one of the best medical journals in the world. It would be any doctor's dream to get a publication in there, the New England Journal. So they published a landmark trial, as you can see, is back in 2011, uh, where they were able to demonstrate it was a multi-center trial done in North America and Canada, involved tens of thousands of patients, aged 55 to 80. They were all men, they were all smokers or former smokers. And they randomized them into two groups. They either underwent a low-dose CT scan or they went for conventional chest x-rays. And we'll come back to this in a minute. And basically what they were able to demonstrate is that with the black line here demonstrates here we've got the number of lung cancers. And over the period of the trial, you can see that with a low-dose CT scan, at any given time point, at year one, year two, year three, they were detecting far more cancers than compared to old-fashioned chest x-ray. And the way I explain it to my patients in the clinic is simply, a chest x-ray is like old black and white TV. And your CT scan is like a high resolution IPTV, your Astro TV. Similarly, so okay, they've demonstrated with a low dose CT scan, we can pick up the disease earlier. Good, but what does that actually mean? Because it's pointless if we can detect the disease earlier, but the outcomes are the same. But they also demonstrated that the death rate, the mortality from lung cancer, considerably lower as well. These lines diverge in those whom we can pick up early. So that was a real game changer. And on the back of this trial, there was worldwide interest in screening for lung cancer. Many countries in Europe doing studies or trials. In North America, in the US, they now recommend screening for lung cancer in certain age groups. There's reimbursement from their insurance providers as well. So that was the New England study. Um, going back one, the other major study that was published, the results came out last year at the World Lung Cancer Conference in Toronto, was a big European study called Nelson. And what Nelson did was, they, um, it came a little bit later. This was a study conducted in Belgium and the Netherlands, Holland. And their results were even more impressive. They reinforced the American data, but they included patients that were a little bit younger. The age group started at 50. They, again, they were smokers or former smokers, and they included women as well, which the American trial didn't. And what they were able to demonstrate, and I've summarized this here, is that they showed that in high-risk patients, um, with a low-dose CT scan, they were able to reduce the death rate in men by 26%, which is very, very, very impressive. If we got those returns on the stock market, we'll all buy the shares. And in women, about 61%, okay? And of course, if they put the two together, roughly about a 44% reduction in mortality when they split the two cohorts equally. So again, two major trials, well-conducted trials, one in the US, one in Western Europe, fairly recent publications that give strong scientific evidence that screening to detect lung cancer before someone develops the symptoms or the signs is effective. It is truly life-saving. Our challenge and our difficulty is who do we target for screening? So I'll come back to that in a minute, but this is um, an example of how the screening is done. This happens to be the CT scanner in SGMC, but the CT scanners are widely available throughout Malaysia in public and private hospitals. And um, 
when we are screening the lung for lung cancer, we are interested in looking at the lung tissue, the lung parenchyma. We don't need to look at major blood vessels. And why this is relevant is, therefore, you don't need contrast. So they don't need to put a drip, put a little uh, cannula in your hand. Um, they don't need to inject contrast, so we don't need to do a blood test to check your kidney function. The patient or person, they're not even, they're not even a patient, they're a person like us. They do not need to fast. They can walk in and have their scan. And the technology has evolved so rapidly in the last five to 10 years, it is a rapid acquisition scan, meaning even for older patients or someone who's difficulty holding their breath, it's a single breath, 10 to 15 seconds, and is able to scan from the top to the bottom of the lungs. High resolution, no contrast, which means the radiation dose is 90% less than the conventional CT scan where contrast is given. And that is still done, but for other conditions. But for purposes of screening with the intent of trying to detect early stage lung cancer, we don't need contrast. So a non-contrast, low dose CT radiation dose is pretty low. You don't have to fast, you walk in and do rapid acquisition, hold your breath 10 to 15 seconds, that's it. And actually, I think many centers now um, the on the threshold of what is called as the ultra-low dose uh, radiation. Because the question we commonly get asked, and I suspect we'll get asked in the Q&A, yeah, patients are worried about the radiation dose. Because there is radiation. It is a form of ionizing radiation. But the technology gets, has been getting better and better, and the radiation dose is acceptably low. Uh, it's now approaching something like 10 or 15 chest x-rays, or even less than that. And we'll talk a bit about that later. So, in terms of screening, um, as I said to you, we know why we need to screen, because we've got to pick up the disease earlier, and there's strong evidence for screening. The difficulty is still whom should we offer screening to. Now, we can't just copy and paste from the US, because their patient population, or in Europe, is different from ours. We may have a slightly younger population, we have other uh, characteristics. We have a multi-ethnic population. We have a lot of tuberculosis in this country. So screening, like any investigation or scan, is not perfect. If a person goes for a scan, a low dose CT scan, there can only be one of three outcomes. One outcome is, and in most cases, it will be a perfectly normal scan. So you're very, very happy. And the radiologist or your surgeon or physician will tell you, look, Mr. X, at this point in time, we see no evidence of a lung cancer. It looks normal. But that scan is a snapshot of one point in time. I guess it's like your Facebook profile picture. You're on holiday. You're happy. You might be unhappy the next day. So there's no guarantee that you will not then go on to develop a tumor or a cancer in the future. But it's very useful information. The other end of the spectrum is when we pick up someone which has or who has a, an obvious uh, abnormality. But that's when we pick up something that is abnormal, that looks to be an early stage lung cancer. And here, the doctor or the doctors would recommend at the very minimum that you need a follow-up, a surveillance scan. Or if the suspicion is very high, it really looks like a cancer, you may be asked to undergo a biopsy or you may be asked to go for surgery and have it removed. So those two ends of the spectrum, quite clear cut, relatively easy to manage. The difficulty is the in-between, intermediate group where there will be patients or individuals who will have a CT scan that is not entirely normal. At the same time, it also doesn't look like an obvious lung cancer. That is what we call as an indeterminate scan. So not everything in life is black or white. And that is where the indecision comes in. We appreciate that for any one of us, if you're told by a doctor, look, your scan looks OK. There's something there. I don't think it's a lung cancer, but I can't tell you it's fully clear. The first thing that does is it will increase the anxiety and stress for that person. So we are mindful of that. It's very important that therefore we only recommend screening appropriately. And then patient anxiety is a big factor. Another thing, a concept called false positives or the specificity. So a false positive is when a scan picks up something that may not be a cancer. It mimics a cancer. And I wouldn't say we are fooled into it, but everybody, the whole name of the game is to pick up the disease early to make sure we don't miss an early stage tumor. And therefore, it may lead to further scans or biopsies or other tests, some of which can be invasive because of the fear that we don't want to miss a tumor. So in most scenarios, 
unless something is very obvious, what your physician, what your doctor will recommend is what we call as watchful waiting, which is surveillance, to have a follow-up scan at, is, at a determined interval. Because if that lesion, if that nodule in the lung is a true lung cancer, it will declare itself, it will not disappear, it will not stay the same, it will increase, it will change its shape or configuration or get bigger. So what we, um, what we recommend here, based uh, on available scientific evidence from the US and Europe, and taking into consideration the disease burden in our own country, our own local demographics of the Malaysian population, is we advocate screening in this age group. It is not cost effective to screen under that age group. That doesn't mean we will all know of someone who was 35 or 42 who developed lung cancer. But when we talk about screening, we're trying to apply this on a large scale population. And it is not cost effective or ethical perhaps to screen younger than that. Equally, we don't advocate a screening, for example, someone who's 80. Now, we don't discriminate on the basis of age, but chances are if you have a, a tumor picked up at the age of 80, um, probably that is what we call as a biologically insignificant tumor. That person may, may die of old age or some other illness before that tumor gave them a problem. That doesn't mean someone who is 80 can't come and have a scan, but we have to have a bit of science in whom we offer screening to. So at the moment, we advocate approximately in this age group, 45 to 75, men and women. Now, when this forum was advertised, you know, what we were taught in medical school uh, is that lung cancer is a male smoker's disease. And I can tell you, unfortunately, that we are now seeing a lot of cases of lung cancer um, and it's not just a Malaysia problem. When I talk to my colleagues in other countries, it's similar. We are seeing maybe 20, 25% of cases now in non-smokers. And the majority of non-smokers happen to be women. And I think one of the causes for that is passive secondhand smoking or thirdhand smoke, but there may also be other factors at play that we, we haven't identified. And certainly there's a genetic uh, predisposition. But at the moment, the science recommends smokers or former smokers. And there's a certain duration. If you have a personal history, you yourself have had a cancer of some other organ and recovered from that. Unfortunately, for any of us, if you've had one cancer, then the uh, propensity to develop a future or second cancer, be it in the same organ or some other part of the body, is increased. So you may be at risk and you, you perhaps want to consider uh, going for a screening. If you have a family history of premature lung cancer, so obviously, if your grandmother gets, is diagnosed with lung cancer at 85, that is perhaps less relevant. But if you have a first degree sibling, or first degree relative rather, um, who has been diagnosed with lung cancer, then that's, that's highly relevant. Because as with most diseases, there is a genetic basis. Now, one of the challenges is, I told you about 20, 25% of cases of lung cancer are affecting non-smokers and predominantly women. Um, very difficult, there's no absolute way to go forward at the moment, but that's why I put a question mark there. Should we be offering screening to the non-smoker? The truth is nobody knows. I can tell you last month I was in Singapore for a meeting, and Singapore is going to start, I think it's called the Commons or Cohort Study. They're going to start a study where they're going to um, offer screening to men and women who are also non-smokers, because around 40 to 50% of their cases of lung cancer are in Singaporean Chinese non-smoking women. So that's, this is what I mean about tailoring our, based on our local epidemiology, our local statistics. Um, we probably will have to look at that over time. The other risk factors for lung cancer, I think Dr. Chua will talk about that, but if you have chronic lung diseases, COPD, if you have had TB in the past, pulmonary tuberculosis, then you are 10 times more likely to develop a cancer within the scarred lung tissue. But the reverse is not true. The vast majority of people who have TB will never get lung cancer. So please don't walk out of here thinking, I've had TB or I know someone has had TB and go and frighten them and say you're going to get lung cancer, because no. But what I'm saying is if you've had TB compared to someone who's not had TB and say both are non-smokers, then your risk statistically is about tenfold over a lifetime. So that's presently where we are. We recommend this age group, men and women, smokers and former smokers. Um, if you have a personal history of any other cancer, a family history of lung cancer, question mark about non-smokers, chronic lung diseases, TB as well, then you may want to consider screening. The problem with things like TB 
is it can increase the false positive rate and lower the specificity of the test. False positive meaning TB, the scarring or the nodule due to TB can mimic a lung cancer as well. So sometimes there isn't uh, absolutely one test that is uh, um, a definitive. So I probably thought it would be uh, wise to just spend the last few minutes um, and just share with you a few things since I am a cardiothoracic surgeon and um, I guess most of you hope you won't meet me. But um, as a surgeon, when we are, usually by the time the patient sees a surgeon, uh, our colleagues, be it the oncologists or the chest physicians, have meticulously investigated and worked up the patient. Not always, but usually we know we're dealing with a suspected or proven lung cancer. And the CT scan has been done, and the PET scan has been done, and the spirometry lung function, which some of you did outside, has been done. And sometimes they need an echo to see how strong or weak their heart is, and various other investigations. So the decision-making as a surgeon is twofold. One, I need to decide operability. That means I need to know this person who has a lung cancer, are they fit enough for the operation? And for this, we look at things like the age of the patient. Uh, of course, as we know, there's chronological and biological age. We have a, a soon-to-be 94-year-old prime minister who's probably fitter than most of us. Uh, but generally speaking, the older we are, our tissues are more frail and our likelihood of developing a complication increases. We look at the age, we look at the heart function, we look at the pulmonary or lung function, the nutritional status, so we can look at things like their blood protein level, albumin, etc. Um, and that tells us whether or not, it, some of it is um, a bit of judgment, clinical judgment. If you look at the man or woman in front of you in your clinic and you make an assessment and you think, yes, I think this person will tolerate the operation that they need, will come through it uh, with an acceptable risk. So that is the operability or in simple terms, the fitness for surgery. We also have to look at the resectability. The resectability is a technical decision making where the surgeon, he or she, has to determine, based on the CT or PET scan or MRI or various tests, whether or not he or she thinks I can remove the tumor. Now, unlike other diseases with lung cancer, you've got to remove the tumor completely. And when we do an operation, a proper operation, a proper cancer operation, the surgeon will remove the tumor. They will always endeavor. We always try to remove the tumor completely. And you will also do what is known as systematic lymph node dissection. So we clear all the lymph nodes that are in the chest cavity. Uh, it's complex, but it's necessary. Because whatever is removed is then sent to the pathologist, and they will look at it under the microscope. And that gives us the final, what we call as the pathological staging. So somebody may have had investigations and have been referred with early stage, for example, a stage 1A, and based on the CT and the PET scan, the tumor is fully removed. The lymph nodes that we remove at the time of the operation may come back showing microscopic disease, what the human eye can't see, what the surgeon's eye can't see, what the PET scan or CT scan cannot pick up. So that person is upstaged. They have moved up from a stage 1A for early stage tumor to perhaps maybe a 2B, 3A. And why that is relevant is that person will then benefit and need to see an oncologist and benefit from adjuvant therapy, which is some form of chemo or radio immunotherapy. And here, uh, the treatments have got quite advanced and quite personalized. It's uh, what we call as bespoke therapy. It's not the old fashioned days where everybody gets chemotherapy and it works in some and it doesn't in the others. So from the tumor tissue, either from the biopsy before surgery or from the tumor that we remove, molecular testing can be done to determine what genes or mutations are expressed and then more targeted personalized therapy can be offered to that person. But in terms of the surgery, the gold standard operation is to do what is called as a lobectomy. So we've got two lungs, I'm sure everybody knows that. Our right lung has three bits, an upper, middle, and lower. We call them lobes, upper, middle, and lower lobe. The left lung is an upper and lower lobe. That, I mean, it's not very proportionate the way it's been drawn here, but it's just to illustrate three lobes on the right and two lobes on the left. If a person has a confirmed primary lung cancer, meaning it originates from the lung and not spread from somewhere else to the lung, then the correct treatment is to remove that part of the lung that is the gold standard treatment anywhere in the world, provided that person is fit enough for the operation, because that gives the best chance of a cure, the best chance of long-term survival, and the lowest chance of recurrence. 
However, there may be scenarios where the patient is uh, quite elderly, has very poor lung function, is a very high-risk individual, then sometimes we may elect, having discussed with the patient and the family and the other specialists involved, we may elect to do a lesser operation called a wedge resection, where we remove a slice, like a slice of cake. We can only do that for tumours that are on the outside, the periphery of the lung, not tumours that are towards the middle. And that is a compromise where the surgeon feels, if I did the gold standard operation, they don't have enough lung capacity, they, they may not survive the operation or they'll be too breathless after surgery. So we do a compromise procedure, like a wedge or a segmental resection, slightly smaller. We still remove the tumour, but we accept that the chances of local recurrence, the cancer coming back, is slightly increased. And again, that's the same illustration with a lobectomy. A pneumonectomy is when we remove an entire lung. We only need one lung to live on, that's a fact. Uh, we do less of this these days, thankfully, a pneumonectomy. It's a big operation. We still do a handful a year, but the vast majority of what we do is a lobectomy. So in terms of the surgery, it's under general anesthesia. Um, Sometimes we're able to do it through a smaller incision, keyhole surgery. Sometimes we do it through a conventional, slightly bigger cut called a thoracotomy. That is actually less relevant. What is important is that the patient is accurately staged. What is important is that um, the tumor is fully removed, the lymph nodes are fully removed, the patient is accurately staged after the operation, that they recover well, and then they receive the adjuvant, additional treatment if required, be it chemo, radio, immunotherapy. Uh, the wounds, whether they're a bit bigger, big, small, or less relevant, they will heal. And the vast majority of patients do well. So in summary, ladies and gentlemen, for this morning, what I want to just um, leave you with is, is the following, that our awareness of lung cancer as a society is still very low. There was a local survey published a few years ago uh, looking at, I think they actually asked uh, a group of secondary school teachers, so this is an educated group, and whilst 90% appreciated that you know, smoking was a risk factor for lung cancer, 60 odd percent thought that it was a communicable disease, that you know, it could spread from one person to the other. And a similar percentage as well thought it only affects men. So as a society, our awareness is still terribly low, and that includes doctors, primary care doctors, we don't think about it enough. You dismiss the cough or the, you know, the uh, symptoms and, and they just have endless causes of antibiotics. So if you have symptoms, uh, persistent troublesome cough or you're coughing up blood or phlegm or a change in the character of your cough, if you have a chronic cough, all these things you need to insist at the very least on a chest x-ray. Ask your GP or go to a local hospital and get a chest x-ray. So our awareness needs to increase and that can only be through education and through forums like this, I hope. Number two, screening, right? Detecting the disease earlier. We know why, because too many cases picked up too late with bad outcomes, so it's a no-brainer. And we know how to do it with low-dose CT. It's very cost-effective, it saves lives. We just need to target the right group. Uh, why? Because screening leads to early detection, which leads to better outcomes, better survival. Surgery, usually the treatment of choice, for early stage disease, but in the context of what we call as multimodality, meaning they may need chemo, radio, immunotherapy, usually after and sometimes before. So it's pointless comparing my friend had this and my cousin had that. Every patient is individual, depending on the biology of the tumor, the molecular characteristics, the size, the location, and the patient profile in terms of what is appropriate. So it's basically personalized therapy. I think that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Anand, for the very informative presentation. Ladies and gentlemen, for the next session, join me in welcoming Dr. Chua up on stage to share the importance of recognizing the symptoms of lung cancer and the various treatment options available for advanced lung cancer patients. Let's give him a round of applause. Right. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Right. So uh, it's good to see you all on this uh, nice uh, Saturday uh, morning. Hopefully, after this uh, 50 minutes or so, uh, I will share a little bit with you about uh, how uh, we as a doctors right, have been struggling to fight this uh, horrible disease in lung cancer. 
right? Now, Dr. Anand had, has explained to you, uh, I think he gave a very uh, nice uh, bird-eye view about the landscape of lung cancer burden in Malaysia and also how we nowadays, we are, we are now determined to fight it, okay, to pick up our patient at an earlier stage and also give them a cure, a chance of a cure. But I can assure you that for the past 14 years as a lung specialist, right, I really have been struggling to treat patients, get them, diagnose them early and really treat them well. In contrast to uh, what Dr. Anand has, uh, has talked about, I think my talk over the next uh, 50 minutes is going to be a bit more practical in terms of like, what my patients go through when they come and see me for the lung cancer. Right, I would like to start with some sharing of experience. Okay, so obviously over the years, I've seen many, many, many lung cancer, too many than, than what I like. Right, so uh, I'll just pick up a few cases. Now the first case, right, is quite a typical case. Right, typically lung cancer, at least in the past, affect men who are smoker, right, so, and also a bit elderly. Right, this man who came to see me before, he was 62 years old. He was a heavy smoker, uh, two packs a day for 40 years. He had been coughing quite a fair bit for a long time. Uh, in fact, for, uh, just before he came to see me, he actually coughed off blood. Right? And he has so, got this uh, swollen face and arms, of which he couldn't quite understand. He just said he thought it's water retention. Uh, so he, uh, after he saw me, obviously, I put him through multiple tests. Right, and uh, eventually I reached the diagnosis of a stage 4 lung cancer with a superior vena cover obstruction and also involvement of the lymph node, liver and the bone. Right? Now this is how he looked like on presentation how when you come and see me. He, he, he's a bit swollen okay? and, um, and you may just appreciate that his face was a bit more red and also there's some very, very dilated vein, this very unusual vein that comes out on the chest wall. And you compare his hand and his leg, you can see that the hands are, it was swollen and the leg was okay. You can see the tendon here, so the legs was fine. You can appreciate the color, the skin color is, it was a bit different as well between the hand and the, and the foot, right? So what happened is that his lung cancer has caused an obstruction or blockage on this superior vena cava, which is a vein. Now this is a superior vena cava referring to this vein here. Now this vein right, actually is responsible to carry the blood back from the hands and the arms and from the face back down to the heart. And then the heart will pump it into the lung and to get oxygenated again. So now his lung cancer sit here or sat here, the lung cancer here, blocking this uh, superior vena cava. So the blood from the arm and the face right, couldn't go back into the heart as normal. That's why it becomes swollen and it becomes congested with blood. Right, so, uh, so what happened is that uh, um, we, we started him on, uh, we, we put a stand on the, uh, we, basically there was a blockage of the vein, isn't it? So uh, what we did is that we put a stent into the area, stented and uh, opened the, uh, the vein to allow the blood flow to go back to normal. Subsequently, he actually underwent uh, li uh, first line chemotherapy, which didn't work very well. The second line came, uh, so we changed the chemotherapy. It worked a bit better, but still uh, it wasn't good enough. We gave him radiotherapy to the leg, okay, because it, it was so painful because of cancer uh, in his bone, in the, in the thigh, actually. Then he went on to, to, uh, to the third line chemotherapy, ended up with a lot of side effects. And also, even, even he was hospitalized for bad infection because of the chemotherapy. Right, so now I'll just show you a picture of him in the hospital. Okay, so at, at that time, right, you can see he, he had lost a lot of his hairs because of the chemotherapy. Uh, but you can see that uh, the, the vein had disappeared from the chest wall. Uh, and, and also the face has kind of shrunken a bit. It's no longer congested with blood. So it means that we, at least that part, uh, we treated him well. We have allowed the normal blood flow through that vein. Right, so after, after the, the last episode, right, he said, okay, enough, right, I have had enough. Thank you very much, Dr. Chua. Uh, I don't want to go through any more of this chemotherapy. So he went on to receive best supportive care. Basically, we just support his symptoms, uh, make him comfortable. Uh, then, but obviously, the lung cancer all continued to progress without treatment, and he passed away three months later. He survived for 10 months. Right, so uh, 10 months after the diagnosis, the initial diagnosis. So this is a very typical case we used to see day in and day out. Right, case number two, okay, is a, is a, a younger patient, 38 years old, lady who never smoked. 
right? So she was pregnant at the time, 28 weeks, when she came to us complaining of cough and later become very breathless, right? So uh, then again, she went, uh, she, uh, we had done multiple tests, found her to have lung cancer at stage 4. And the cancer has gone to the lymph node, the lung, and so the lymphatic system, and also causing the water accumulated outside the right lung called right perifusion. Right, this was her x-ray showing the, the water accumulated outside the right lung. And this is a scan showing the tumour sitting in the upper part of the right lung. And the rest of the lung fields are very abnormal with a lot of cancers inside her lung. Now, so uh, uh, subsequently, right, we actually put her on uh, this treatment that was very new at the time, right, what we call a targeted therapy. She responded very well at the time. All right? So eventually, she went on with her, with her pregnancy. At 36 weeks, all right, she, had a, she delivered a healthy baby, okay? 2.08 kilometer. Uh, 2.08 kilograms, sorry. Right? <laughs> kilometer, wow, we're very long. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Cannot hide in the uterus. All right? so, uh, and also, she managed to deliver by a, a spontaneous vaginal delivery. It means normal delivery, actually. The, pediatri the pediatrician in charge was very happy with the baby. He said it was a very healthy baby. Uh, so this was the scan at the time after she delivered, we immediately do a scan, we found that, oh, you see the cancer from here, this area, uh, it become this area. It's still not normal actually, but it's obviously a lot better, okay, compared to when she first came. Uh, but subsequently, the, the disease progressed, right, this is what we go through, right, the disease, after the treatment works for a while, then the disease is progressed, right, so and then subsequently she went through chemotherapy, chemotherapy, some more chemotherapy, and some more chemotherapy. Right, but subsequently, she didn't make it. So subsequently, we run an option, the cancer become uncontrollable, and she died two years after the diagnosis. Now, this case is more tragic, okay? Because right, she, lived behind, she left behind right, five kids, and the youngest one was two years old, right, which she delivered at the time. Right, so, uh, so I mean, uh, this is another case. Uh, I, be, I always bring this case up because this case, we are also stuck because she did nothing wrong, actually. She was young, she never smoked and she get lung cancer, and she kills her after two years. Right, so, um, so I think, um, uh, so that, that will bring me to, to, the, to the, the main part of my talk now, okay? So uh, hopefully over the next 30 minutes or so, okay, I'll bring you through all these things, right? Number one is the symptoms and signs of lung cancer. How do we know that someone has got lung cancer? When someone comes into my clinic, they tell me about uh, what, 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 when, what, when do I suspect they got lung cancer, okay? What, what sort of things patients tell me and what are the things that I can pick up when I, and when I check them, okay, by the bedside. The second part is the risk factors, okay? So a risk factor means that who is at an increased risk of lung cancer. Who gets it more? Okay, so, um, so obviously, for, with patients with risk factors of lung cancer, then, then uh, we'll be have to be more careful when we, when we uh, 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 carry out investigation, right? Uh, we have to be a bit more vigilant, uh, vigilant to carry out investigation to make sure whether they do or they do not have lung cancer. Investigation are the tests I put them through. I put my patient through when I, when I suspect that they have got lung cancer. What do I ask them to do? Okay, to eventually to reach the diagnosis, okay, and also to plan their subsequent treatment. The last part is treatment. Okay, the treatment is, is going to cover the, the more of the later stage of the lung cancer. Now again, Dr. Anand saying 90% presented late. So 90% of them right, actually will receive this kind of treatment that I'll, I'll, I'll share with you in a short while. Right? Whereas I'm not going to touch on the early stage one. The early stage disease, right, stage 1 and 2, right, I'll be referring to Dr. Anand. Hopefully, the patient can go through operation and get a cure and can be cured from the lung cancer. Right, so what are the common okay, symptoms of lung cancer? Number one, coughing. Right, so uh, it can be a dry cough, it can be a product, uh, it can be a cough with phlegm. The phlegm can be white color, can be can be green color, can be yellow color, can be any color, including those with mixed with blood. Right now, hemoptysis right is serious. Right, so in, uh, I mean the common causes of hemoptysis. Sorry, hemoptysis means a uh, cough out blood. Okay, cough out blood. Uh, usually, is uh, I, usually, usually I think about lung cancer or TB in Malaysia. These two things. Obviously, there are many, many other causes. Uh, but, but when you see this thing, uh, when they cough out blood, nowadays uh, it's very convenient. They take a snapshot with their uh, smartphone and uh, they can have a look. Okay, so, so when, they bring out quite a, when they brought out quite a lot of blood, uh, it's, it's time to be careful in terms of uh, to test them properly to see what's going on. 
The next part is a breathing difficulty. Sorry, dyspnea means a breathing difficulty. Yeah? So, so usually, it's like the second case, the lady with a lot of cancer inside, inside the lung. Then the, the lung couldn't function properly. That's when they, they become breathless. Sometimes it can also be due to water accumulation outside the lung or outside the heart. Also, uh, the lung cancer does that. So when all this blood, uh, when all this water accumulated outside the lung, it can compress on the lung, it can compress on the heart, and the patient becomes very breathless as a result. Okay, right. I'm sure most of you know this man. This man did not have lung cancer. Lah, huh? So but I just want to bring up his picture right, about how uh, my patient, right, actually lose weight, actually. You know, cancer, right, is something that you know, is, she, is there is to consume. Cancer cells are there to consume our energy or our nutrition on our body. So towards the late stage of it, right, like this man here got pancreatic cancer. So, uh, at, but lung cancer at the advanced stage looks the same. Okay, basically the cancer cell consume away all the nutrition and the patient keep losing weight until they become very, very, very thin. Right, so uh, it's also quite common, okay, to see a leaf node enlargement in the neck, right? So uh, basically, the cancer, right, the lung cancer, one of the area it likes to go to uh, is a leaf node, right? It's a, it, uh, it, it usually it goes to a leaf node in, uh, in the in inside the the uh, lung first. Those we cannot see because it's deep inside. But the next station or the next leaf node it goes through right, is usually the neck here in this area. Right, so uh, usually when, when we palpate, uh, when we can feel a, a leaf node here, right, then usually it's, it's very bad. Just recently, and in fact, at the moment in the ward, I got a patient with a huge, huge leaf node over here. I think easily measure about 5 to, five to 7 cm, large one, right? But I mean, he has got uh, uh, stomach cancer, la, but, but still, when, when someone feel a leaf node enlargement, some, some, some swelling over this area, right, usually, it, usually it's not a good sign. Right, so other things will be things like chest pain. Okay, so because when the when the lung cancer, right, you now when lung cancer when it's very small, so like Dr. Anan say, when it's very small, early stage, there's no symptoms. Okay, so it keep growing, it keep growing from very small, from uh, from one mm, keep growing, keep growing. When one day, right, it touches the membrane of the lung. When it goes outside, expand outwards, and when it touches the membrane of the lung that's near to the ribs, uh, that's when the people get pain. Now, this is the nature of the lung. Inside the lung, right, there's there's very there's very little innovation. It's not very well innovated. That's why when it's growing very small inside, we don't feel it. Whereas the lung membrane, the membrane of the lung or the rib cage uh, is better innervated, right? So basically, there's more nerve. Sorry, there's more nerve in this area. So when the tumor grow and grow and grow, right? When it hit this area, that's when people come to say, "Oh, it's painful here," and there's a tumor sitting inside. Stroke-like symptoms. Okay, that's when the cancer goes to the brain. Right, so uh, usually when lung cancer go to the brain, uh, there's usually the the one last the one the, the one the one of the latest latest presentation of disease already. Now, when when the when the tumor when the cancer spread to the uh, spread to the brain, uh, then then the patient become become like a stroke like that. Uh, if the it's, it's spread to the right side, the right the right side of the brain, then the left side cannot move. Spread to the left side of the brain, the right side cannot move. Right, so initially we thought, oh, it's a stroke. But if you do a scan, oops, we found tumors. We can find tu uh, cancer inside there. Okay, or next one, no symptoms, right? So, so sometimes uh, they, uh, my patient come with come to see see us with something else, and we check and check and found them to have lung cancer. Or some of them, in a way, also in the past, I've got a few. You can say lucky patient, kind of. Uh, they go for medical checkup. On the x-ray, found something. Uh, then a few of them right, managed to go through an operation, get a cure, and they survived very well. Uh, but these are, uh, these are, these are, the, 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 uh, these are not the norm. Uh, these are rarity. Right? So, but no, sometimes they, they have no symptoms despite have harboring a cancer inside their lungs. Right, so then th that's the first part, the symptoms and signs. So, so those, are, those are the common things okay, I see uh, when my patient walks in with a lung cancer. Right, the next part is a risk factors. Now, who gets it more? Now, uh, we always talk about this thing. Now, th this is uh, one of the main problem that causes uh, lung cancer. Right, so uh, uh, for for those, uh, I mean, it's, a, it's uh, for those still haven't picked it up yet. Don't worry, it's a cigarette smoking. Right, so I mean, cigarette smoking, right, has been proven well over and over again to cause lung cancer. Right, so uh, and in fact, smokers are twenty times more likely, right, to get lung cancer compared to non-smokers. 
right? So, uh, so that's why a, a lot of uh, a lot of my patient or my even my friends, right, tell me that, ooh, smoking give me wings. <laughs> I say, yeah, right. Smoking can give you lung cancer. When the only time the smoking can give you wings, right, is give you lung cancer, kills you, and you get your wings to fly to heaven. I hope. Right, so no, cancer do not give you wings, I tell them. Right, so, um, uh, so, so I mean, so as a chest physician, right, we, I never get tired of talking about smoking cessation over, over and over again, right? Because, you know, this smoking, the, the, the adverse effect, I mean, the, the uh, cigarette smoking is dangerous. It's been proven, right, since 1915, you know, there was a first report from, uh, from the US, right? Ever since then, right, more and more data comes in, uh, associated the linkage between cigarette smokes and lung cancer, as well as also other cancers. Uh. Right, but, but still, I mean, you can see that we are, we, are, we, are, we are so much behind, right, in terms of helping people to quit smoking, helping people to stop smoking. In fact, in Malaysia, right, the, smokings, the smokers' numbers are on the up, right? So, so we are not doing enough. So I think, I, I think at least, uh, I'm, obviously, there are NGOs, there are, there are doctors who are really keen on this. They are really working hard at the national, national level to control tobacco in Malaysia. As a physician, okay, as a doctor, all I can do is I talk to each individual patient that I come across, tell them that, hey, please quit smoking. So how? How can I help them to quit smoking on an individual level? Motivation, okay, motivation. So, so basically, right, the most important thing, uh, the most important factor right, to, for someone to successfully quit smoking right, is actually their own motivation. They must say that, hey, yes, I, w- I am a smoker, I want to quit smoking. That is the single most factor right, to help them to quit smoking. Uh, not all my, all, not all the things that I'm, do, I'm going to do as a doctor actually. So, so usually I sometimes I, I, I get get the family involved as well. Uh, so a uh, uh, smoker tends to be men. Uh, so I usually talk to the wife. Hey, come on, keep nagging or husband, uh, ask me to quit smoking, right? So so the uh, so the next part is education, uh, right? So surprisingly, some some of some people, a lot of patients, including my friends, say no lah, smoking we got problem. Man. Okay, so I don't feel anything. Uh, smoking, I feel I feel good. But so all, all we can do is uh, we keep educating them, tell them about the the uh, the the, the ca- causal relationship, as in the, the 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 fact that cigarette smokes lead to cancer la, stroke la, heart attacks la, and things like that, right? So uh, social support, okay, getting the family involved, and the last thing is a medication. Now a lot of people are aware of nicotine replacement therapy, uh, Nicorex, either a chewing type or the patch type. But actually, right, that's not too not too effective. Uh. Nowadays, we have got a more effective things that uh, we call Champix or Veroniclin. It's a tablet that people can swallow. This one has actually proven okay to have a higher success rate to help smokers to quit smoking. Right. So, uh, but uh, but uh, and, and, uh, but the problem. Some sometimes some of my patients, okay, they are very obedient. They quit smoking after a while. Uh, but the thing is, relapse is very common. As in, they quit and they smoke it back again. Right. It's very common. But I, I think I, I always I try to encourage them to say that relapse is common. It's not their fault. Okay. A lot of people relapse. But if you do it once, I'm sure you can do it again uh, to quit smoking. On, uh, at the at the national level, at the policy making level, okay, so there are people who are there are uh, uh, um, physicians, doctors, NGOs are very working very hard on it. I mean, increasing tax is one thing lah, okay. So, but I suspect not very effective lah. Right, my friends still buying right. I think the pack of cigarettes are going from I don't know maybe five six ringgit, maybe now about twenty ringgit. I think, but they're still buying lah, So. Right, so so may not may not be the most effective thing. I mean, with increasing tax, again, people argue that uh, the the uh, smuggling activity actually increase. Uh, so uh, secret smug, uh, smug, smugglers actually bring in more uh, illegal cigarettes. Uh, controlling advertisement, obviously, we don't see any more uh, tobacco advertisement anymore. So there's there's quite uh, there's quite well done. Uh, increase the non-smoking area is another co- uh, the, the thing that we just recently implemented. Right, so again, facing facing uh, ob- uh, facing obstacles. Uh. so obviously a lot of people complain. Hey, what what's where is our right as a smokers uh, to smoke and all these things? But obviously for us, it's the right thing to do. Okay, expanding the non-smoking area. Okay, uh, uh, and also uh, to to basically to reduce the area that where smokers can enjoy their cigarette smoking. Right, so and definitely it's something I, I enjoy as a person. Uh. Nowadays I walk past bars, uh, restaurants, uh, I can I can enjoy the environment. I can without without worry about the cigarette uh, smokes uh, going around me. 
So, uh, so support, okay, basically is that uh, Ministry of Health is uh, again very aggressive with this. There's now a very commonly we can see smoking cessation clinic to, uh, to offer treatment to smokers. And also there, there's a hotline, I think uh, Dr. Anand put it in his slides, there's a number where smokers can call, can call and, and get some uh, psychological support to help them to quit smoking. Right, so so this uh, so smoking cessation is very important, right? So because smoking is is the most uh, proven and the the, the, the proven uh, reason of someone uh, of people getting lung cancer. Right, so passive smoking also counts. Okay, passive smoking right is as bad as first hand smoking. All right, it's full stop. Right, so but the only thing is we cannot quantify smoking. You know, for as a doctor, we can quantify active smoker. We can tell them that oh, you have reached five uh, pack years, ten pack years. We can tell when people right who smokers are, uh, they are at a in increased risk of lung cancer or other lung diseases. But for passive smoking, right, we couldn't. But it's proven that it's, it's harmful. Right, so so for smokers who smoke in front of their family, smoking in front of their kids. Okay, oh, that's, that's a really a no-no thing, right? But it's called what, something that we also commonly see. Air pollution, haze, right? Now, obviously, uh, again, now I have to say, scientifically, it, it may not be proven scientifically because haze, right, is again difficult to quantify and it's not something that is constant. Uh, you, constant means that uh, uh, smokers can tell me that they smoke 21 box a day. But uh, haze, right? You cannot tell me that I cannot tell you that how much haze you have in, you have inhaled into your lungs at any particular year. Now, for the past one week, uh, the haze, the our 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 index is going up, so the uh, the haze is coming back a bit. So so with every breath we take, uh, with all this haze thing uh, going in, uh, it also increase the the stress to the lung and increase the likelihood of lung diseases in the future. Now and in the future, sorry. There's also indoor pollution. Again, uh, it has been proven that uh, in a more rural area, I suspect maybe not Kang Valley, lah, uh, for in a more rural area where people use biomass fuel, some people burn woods, uh, charcoal, lah, and it, uh, to, to, for cooking. And if they don't ventilate the kitchen well, if they don't ventilate the environment well, right, they are, it's as if like, they are smoking uh, as, they, as they are cooking okay, inside the kitchen. Right. Other things will be like uh, occupational exposure to carcinogens. So basically, it's a, some work right, is more uh, dangerous than other, other work. Right? So asbestos is one. Asbestos right, is something that we use to build uh, sh uh, ship uh, vessels. Uh, uh, and also, uh, it's sometimes used as a heat insulator for roof. Okay, so uh, so, and also, so uh, this is, uh, again, very well proven to link to lung cancer. Right, so that, that's why um, you know for asbestos, one of the most famous area is actually Perth, Australia, because there's a there's a there's a, a very um, there's a there's a lot of mining activity in Perth in the past. So now after uh, uh, 20, 30, 40 years, right, these miners right are getting uh, lung cancer nowadays. Okay, silica, diesel fuels, and also other things as well. So certain jobs, uh, where I, I always ask about, about what they do, okay, and certain jobs, we have to be careful. They, they are at an increased risk of getting lung cancer. History of other cancer, for example, so lymphoma, ur urinary bladder cancer, head and neck cancer, like uh, nasal nose cancer, nose cancer. So all these things are, are also related to smoking as well. So if someone smoked enough to get a nose cancer, right, they, are po they probably have also smoked enough right, to get a lung cancer at some point in their life. The thing is, you know, nose cancer, there's a high chance of cure on uh, a lot of time. A lot of people get cured from lung, uh, nose cancer. Or they survive, they survive, they survive. At some point, right, they may just get a lung cancer. Right, history of lung diseases like COPD. COPD, right, basically, it stands for chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Basically, it's a smoking-related lung weakness. Right, so again, it's something that's due to smoking. So they, get, they smoke enough to get COPD, then they, they, they would have smoked enough to get lung cancer at some point. Pulmonary fibrosis is a hardening or scarring of the lung. Commonly in Malaysia due to TB, right? So very recently, I forgot case we had got scarring of the lung, right? So probably due to previous TB. Now the the thing the, there's a, a tumor just pop up from a scar, right? So again, it's not something common. Uh, it's not common actually. A lot of my patients uh, end up end up TB patient after they take TB treatment, they all they are all well. Uh, it, but but it's something that this just may happen. Right. So uh, the next part is uh, investigation. 
So what uh, what do I do if, uh, if 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 they come and see me? They come and see me. I suspect they come come with symptoms of lung cancer. When I check them, when I, when uh, uh, when I examine them, I find that hey, there's something going on that I really suspect lung cancer. The first thing uh, I ask my patient to do is an X-ray. First thing is is a least invasive. Okay, it's easily available. Even in a certain GP clinic, we can do it. So it is a this is a starting point. So sometime on the X-ray, we can see very straightforward. There's a there's a tumor here, right? So now this triangular shaped thing is the heart, right? This is the right diaphragm. This is the left diaphragm. Diaphragm divides uh, separate. So the diaphragm separates the lung and the stomach uh, or the abdomen, right? So in in this X-ray, there's a lung cancer sitting here. After, if the X-ray really show a mass, okay, really show a lung cancer inside it, X-ray is not going to be good enough, right? So we need to do a CT scan, right? Because CT scan, right, gives us a much better uh, uh, information about what is going on inside the lung. So uh, this is a CT scanner. So, uh, so um, you know, for uh, just like I mentioned that uh, the lung cancer like to go to lymph node la, liver la, bone la, all these things, X-ray cannot pick up. Okay, we need a scan to pick out all this information. As in, has a, has the has, where has a case, uh, cancer spread to? If 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 it has la. so so th so that's why sometimes we call it a staging CT scan. We use a CT scan to tell us the extent of the cancer spread. Okay, PET scan is relatively new, but not that new la. I remember that. 10 years ago, when I first started as a lung specialist. Uh, so I think this is still very, very uncommon. PET scan, uh, I think at that time, only, um, only two machines in Malaysia. That's like 10 years ago. Right? One of them, I remember, is in Putrajaya. The other one, I think it was in, um, it was in this center, in, somewhere in KL. Right? So, but nowadays, uh, PET scan uh, is become, has become more and more important. Uh, nowadays, uh, most of the big hospitals uh, will have one. SGMC obviously has one. Uh. So, uh, so basically, right, the PET scan uh, is what we call a metabolic scan. Metabolic uh, means that it doesn't look at the structure that well. It looks at metabolic as in, as in if it's something active inside the body, right, it will just light up, light up like that. So something active like cancer, lo. cancer is very active. Huh? Cancer or continuously forever is very active. Huh? It's trying to divide itself, divide itself, become bigger and bigger. At the same time, it's, con it's, it's taking our, our nutrition from our body to allow that process to go on. Right? So when, when this process of very active, uh, uh, very active metabolism going on, right, then we can see this, uh, this thing lighting up. So, uh, if, so sometimes we see uh, lighting of, of the area of the lung, so there's lung cancer. Then sometimes we can see leaf node. If the cancer has spread to the leaf node, uh, then that leaf node right, will also light up. Okay, so then we know that there's something active going on inside this lymph node. Uh, then it's likely that there's a cancer there. The bone is the same, the liver is the same. So if, if, uh, if, there's, uh, if there's cancer in the liver, then some part of the liver will, will just light up, uh, will just light up with, uh, with something like that. So with this right, PET scan, right, it's, it's more accurate compared to a CT scan to tell us the, the, the extent of the spread of the lung cancer. Right, so it's, it's now a, a very important tool, for, uh, to, to do, uh, important test to do as well for my lung cancer patient. Right, so after, after all these things, okay, then uh, if you have confirmed okay, that okay, there's a lung cancer there, it may or may not have spread to other organs. Then the next thing we need to do right, is a biopsy. Biopsy right, means that we have to small, take a small piece of the thing out. Okay, to number one, to confirm, to put it under the microscope to confirm that this is a lung cancer. Okay, so and also right after it's confirmed to be a lung cancer, right, we can do DNA testing on it, what we call molecular testing, like, But we call you can say analyze the DNA. This um, uh, DNA analysis uh, nowadays is very important because this DNA analysis right allows us to choose the best treatment for this patient, for, for individual patient, right? So that's why biopsy is, is a must nowadays. So um, most commonly nowadays uh, is uh, we, what we do, uh, what we call a CD guided lung biopsy. Basically, right, we put the patient into in the in the in, in, on in the uh, on the CD scanner again, and then uh, usually it's not done by me. It's done by an interventional radiologist. There's a doctor who specialized in doing this kind of thing. Then he will be putting a needle in. Uh, you can see the needle in coming this way, right? So uh, and he'll be guided by the by the uh, by the CD scanner to see how deep he has to go. Once he, uh, once the uh, interventional radiologist is sure that the needle is now sitting inside the tumor, and he took a bite, he took a bite again, okay, and then we'll, he can retrieve a small piece of it, and then we can do analysis on it. 
So this is now uh, the very common uh, way of doing a biopsy now. Because uh, nowadays, right, we find that lung cancer right, has, has become more and more commonly is located uh, at the peripheral of the lung. As it more, it's more outside, so it's a bit more accessible uh, from, uh, by doing from outside. So sometimes uh, we do it from inside. From doing it inside means that we do a bronchoscopy. Bronchoscopy is that we put a scope into the mouth, into the throat, and into the lung. Right, so sometimes if it's a central lesion, if the cancer is, is more towards the center part, uh, then it's better to do it this way. So sometimes in a bronchoscopy, we can see that there's a tumor growing here. Then what I do is that I pass, pass through a forcep, okay, a forcep, okay, to, to pass through that, pass through my, my bronchoscope and take a small piece out from here. Right, so this is more applicable if the lesion or the cancer is, is sitting in the middle of the lung. Right, but as I say, more commonly nowadays, um, it's more and more common the cancer is sitting more outside of the lung, actually. Now, there's a reason for it, but I won't go into it. Okay, sometimes we can do puroscopy. Right? Puroscopy uh, mean, uh, is applicable for people with pro-effusion. Right? So sometimes cancer spread to the membrane of the lung, creating uh, water accumulated outside the lung. Then what we can do uh, is that we put in a scope through the skin here. Uh, we open a small hole there, like, usually about 2 cm like that. Right? So, and then the scope goes in there. Again, we can see inside uh, to see what's going on. Right? So we suck out the water first. We suck out all the water. And then we can see the lung. We can see the membrane of the lung and the chest wall. So sometimes we can see a lump, uh, a cancer sitting here. And then again, we can pass through a forcep through this scope into this area. And then we can take a bite of this thing. Right, so again, send for analysis, confirm it's cancer, and do DNA testing on the, on the, on the cells. Right, so some, um, most of the time, we will need some blood tests. Right, so uh, blood tests will, will be, uh, I mean, once it's confirmed, it's important to do things like or kidney blood tests, liver blood tests, uh, because all these are very important, because cancer can affect these organs, and also treatment will be, will, 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 will also de be depending on the function of kidney and the liver. Sometimes we do calcium. Uh, lung cancer, as for some patients, can cause high calcium. High calcium can cause problems, so if it's there, then we, we have to treat it and we lower it down. Lung function test is more applicable for early stage lung cancer. A lung function test, right, is, oh, I think some of you have done already uh, outside. Uh. Now, this, this tells us the, the, the function of the lung, how good the lung can function. It's more applicable for early stage cancer because before the anan, I go in and cut out the lung, right, we must make sure the patient will have enough lung function to survive after we chop off that part of the lung. Right? So, so it's more applicable for the early stage patient. Right, so treatment. Okay, now, so again, I stress that it's more of treatment of an advanced lung cancer. So now, if I've done all these things, okay, I sit on the patient and say, okay, Mr. So-and-so, right, you are confirmed with lung cancer. Most commonly, I would say it's stage 4, okay, because of the nature of the disease, because of statistics. So they ask me, what now, Dr. Chua? I say, number one, okay, we can try best supportive care. Best supportive care means that we do not do anything to the cancer. Okay, we help patient to manage their symptoms. Okay, uh, um, um, so basically, is that if they got breathlessness, I help them to relieve their breathlessness. If they got pain, I help them to relieve their pain. If they got some other issues, whatever issue, I I, uh, I just treat them accordingly. But I do not do anything in an attempt to kill off the cancer cells or uh, control cancer cells. This is more applicable for elderly people. Okay, or people with very weak body, like, like people with heart failure, people with, with the heart, can, uh, the, got heart, heart diseases, so they cannot do treatment. Okay, so then this is, this is it. So I tell them that, look, uh, you just come back, whatever problem you have, you tell me, so I can help you to, to solve your problem, to help, hopefully can maximize the comfort. Uh, with um, um, so uh, maximize comfort and also try to minimize the suffering or minimize the symptoms. For this group of patients, is is also good. I always uh, I tend to advise them to get some help from hospice. Okay, now hospice is uh, uh, NGOs. Uh, they they help to help us to manage lung cancer um, cancer patient in general, uh, uh, more advanced cancer patient in a community. So there's a hospice, uh, there's a hospice Malaysia based in Cheras. There's a hospice Asunta based in PJ. There's also a hospice Kase based in Rawang, right? So so these 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 are the very very helpful NGOs. They, they, not only they can provide 
uh, advice. Okay, so because sometimes my patients, uh, sometimes something happened to them, they are lost, they don't know what to do, and uh, and also they sometimes they may say, I may not want to travel all the way to a hospital to see Doctor Chua. So so they can call up these centers, these uh, people in charge, and say, Hey, look, I got I got lung cancer, I got this and this problem. What's your advice? So sometimes a uh, hospice is very good. Sometimes they send their their people, nurses, or sometimes even doctors to the to the house to, to the patient's house to to support my patients in in the house. Okay, so um, the next the next one right is chemotherapy, right? So this has been there for the longest time, right? So uh, chemotherapy basically right, what it does uh, is that once we give into the system, uh, it kills off the active cells, right? So whether it's good or bad, right? Bad is a cancer one, uh, good one is the normal cell inside our body. So um, so obviously the, the 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 theory is that we understand cancer cells is very active. It keep on proliferating, proliferating, uh, become more and more. So we are trying to break it. Uh, we are trying to stop its its proliferation. Okay, so uh, we don't need to grow. Okay, by using all this chemotherapy medication. But the thing is, once it goes in, uh, it also can kill off the normal cells. Now, no, normal cells also referring to the, the more uh, the, the more active cells in the norm, the, the more normal active cells. For example, your hair follicles. Our hair follicles is very active, uh, so it, our hair keep growing, isn't it? So that's why after the chemotherapy, a lot of people lose hair because your hair follicle cannot function properly thanks to the chemotherapy. Right, so uh, so sometimes uh, another uh, active cells in uh, normal active cells in our body is your bone marrow. Right, so so if you hit the bone marrow, if the bone marrow cannot function properly, then um, then the immune system drop because a uh, bone marrow one of the, one of the job it does uh, is create this kind of white blood cell, basically your immune cells. So your bone marrow is affected, then your immune system is down, then people get very bad infection. Right, so that's why there's a uh, significant side effects. Okay, but I have to say that. Um, Nowadays, uh, you know, um, things are moving on. Uh, technology is moving on. You know, science is moving on. Nowadays, uh, the chemotherapy become more and more advanced, uh, become more and more effective with less and less uh, side effects along the way. Right, the next one is targeted therapy. Now, this is uh, newer compared to chemotherapy, not so new. Lah. I remember it first came into the, into the Malaysian market, right, when I was a, a lecturer in UM. That's probably about 10 years ago. Right, so now targeted therapy, right? Well, uh, you, usually, uh, it tends to be a swallow. It's a tablet that people swallow. So uh, once it's swallowed, uh, this uh, this medication goes in uh, to interfere with this what we call a signaling pathway, uh, Okay, so so what it means uh, is that for tumor cells uh, to grow uh, and to escape our immune system for not killing them, uh, it has to it has to do this signaling one. Uh, it's, it's something to do with. Keep, uh, some chemicals, uh, you can say chemicals, hormones. Uh. So, so that's why the tumor cells, uh, they are very smart. They use all these things uh, to escape, to escape uh, the, the, our immune system so it can grow, you see. So when, when this kind of medication goes in, uh, it, it, it can't interfere with all this signaling so that we can stop. Uh, so, so once all this signaling is in, uh, interfered, uh, then the tumor uh, cannot grow. Uh, in fact, some of, some of them even, even uh, uh, end up being killed by the immune system because uh, we, we actually interfere because it cannot, it, cannot, uh, it cannot continue to grow like what it used to. Uh, usually, this kind of thing, because it's, uh, it's very targeted, it only interferes with certain, certain signal inside, our, inside the body. So it, resulted, it results in manageable side effects. Right, so usually my patients do not comp complain too much on, on it. La. So one of the commonest one is what we call the EGFR TKI. So once they take it, right, the most common side effects is some skin rashes. Skin rashes. Because you know why? Because um, um, it because it inhibit this uh, EGFR signal. EGFR signal, right, the cancer cells use it to, to, to grow, but EGFR signal right, is something our skin used to repair itself. So it's a normal signal we have actually. So if once the medication goes in and interfere with this EGFR signal, right, our, the skin be, be, uh, become a pro, uh, they, they may, may come up with a problem with some rashes and things like that. Uh, but the thing is, it can be quite costly, right? So uh, then the next one, right, is uh, immunotherapy, right? So immunotherapy, right, is is is, is very new. Uh, it's very new, especially in Malaysia, la. I would say the uh, the first immunotherapy that was brought into Malaysia market in Malaysia probably no no more than three years, I would say, right? So uh, basically, right, this immunotherapy uh, is is an injectable form, right? So we inject into the vein in the system. Then what it does uh, is that it modifies the interaction between the immune system and the cancer cells. Again, it comes back to our understanding of how cancer cells survive. 
You know, uh, we, we all have immune system. When, there's a can when, the, when the cells try to mutate and become cancer, our immune system will say, hey, this is a bad guy, let's just kill it off. Right? But cancer cells are, it learns. It learns that, hmm, okay, now this immune system is trying to kill me. Eh? Okay, now let me do something. Let me mutate. Let me mutate and I start to produce this thing called PD-1. Right? So, so, uh, so um, basically, it's, it's a chemical. I can call it a chemical. And with this chemical, right, the tumor cells, uh, this cancer cell, uh, escape the immune, immune system surveillance and it's happily growing. Uh. And our immune system say, mm, okay, uh, uh, with, with this hormone, uh, the immune system say, this cancer cell is not a bad guy uh, because, because of this, uh, this hormone, actually, this protein. Uh, so uh, then, then the immune system do, do not kill it, kills it. So this um, immune therapy, once goes in, uh, it, it kind of enhances our immune system and say that, hey, look, this is a bad guy. This is a bad guy, so please go and kill it. Uh, and by, by doing so, right, uh, it's, it's actually using our own immune system right, to kill off the, uh, to kill off the, um, the cancer cells uh, compared to chemotherapy. Chemotherapy is a drug that directly kills off the cancer cell, but this one is actually enhance our own immune system to kill it. Right, so um, so it, so it's it's very new. So and, and so far, right, if, if it works, right, it works very well. Right, so uh, radiotherapy, okay, is uh, we we deliver a dose of radiation to a certain part of our body, la. We cannot irradiate the whole body. So what, what we do uh, is that uh, if let's say the tumor has gone to the brain, uh, then we do radiotherapy to the brain. Uh, if, the tu if the cancer spread to the bone and this one area is very painful despite all this medication, uh, then, uh, then we can do radiotherapy to this area. Sometimes the cancer cell can go to the spine all right, and a patient end up with uh, paralysis of their legs. So sometimes we do radiotherapy to the spine to try to reduce that, that, that mass uh, to, so that the, the nerve uh, spine can go back to normal. So, um, so now, so these are, these are, these are the, the things that we can, we can offer our patient. So which one? Which one is which? So uh, it's, it's actually come back to personalized treatment. Uh, now this one, this kind of thing, uh, there's no one bill fit all. Uh, there's no such thing as, oh, lung cancer patient all go do this first and then this and then this and then this. Nowadays, right, lung cancer treatment has evolved. It has become a very personalized treatment. We need to look at the patient, whether they are, they, are, they are older or younger, whether they've got other illnesses or no. And very importantly, the DNA analysis of the cancer cells. Nowadays, it's become very important for us to decide what, to, what, to, what, to, what treatment to give to our patient. Right, so uh, hopefully over the past 40 minutes, okay, so uh, uh, I've covered all these things, okay, and in terms of uh, lung cancer patients when they come and see me, okay, what's the initial presentation like, what, what do they complain to me, and what can, what can I pick up uh, during physical examination to suspect they've got lung cancer. After that, uh, I also have to understand their background to see where, how, how, how likely they are to have a uh, lung cancer. Uh, then I'll put them through investigation, and then obviously they'll end up with some treatment. Uh. Nowadays, I don't do treatment anymore. Nowadays, I usually either I send to Dr. Anand, if it's early stage cancer, I, or I send to an oncologist for, for the more advanced uh, lung cancer treatment. Right, so I would like to uh, end my presentation today on a high. Okay, it's the last case I want to share with you. Now, this case, uh, this is a lady, 60 years old actually. So when she f first came to us, uh, again, about easily 11, 12 years ago, all right, so she she been coughing, and then again we do do tests and tests. We found her to have, to have this uh, uh, stage four lung cancer again, stage four. All right, so um, so what we do uh, is we start her we started her on this targeted therapy, right? So uh, then it works it work very 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 well, right? So now I saw her when I was in University of Malaya as a lecturer. Now the last time I was chat, uh, talking talking to my my colleague now still in University of Malaya, they told me that she's still alive. 10 years, uh, 10 plus years. And, uh, and, and basically, um, you know, so, so some people do benefit from this kind of treatment. Uh, because one, once the treatment is correct, then patients do very well. Uh, but I, I have to stress, I have to stress, uh, this case is not a norm. Uh, is this case is so special, right? This patient actually become the face of the company, the, the, the company of that product, of that medication. Uh, nowadays, nowadays, she become the ambassador of, of the company. <laughs> Right, so I recently received a pamphlet uh, or a brochure with a face on it and say, oh, our medication worked very well. And there's some testimony from this patient. I think that they must be paying her well to do this thing. <laughs> right, okay, with that, I would like to end my presentation today. Thank you for your time and attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Chua. Ladies and gentlemen,
we now like to invite our doctors up to the stage for the Q&A session. If you have a question for our guest speakers, please raise your hand. Uh, my colleagues will pass you a mic. Let us know your name and where you are from. And let's try to keep it to one question per person so that as we can get to as many people as possible. Um, my husband just did a, a lung biopsy because there's a growth of about 1.2. It started with about 1 cm, then after two months, it was 1.2. So uh, the biopsy results will only come out on the 1st of April. Let's say the result is considered is cancer. Is it necessary to do the PEP scan? Um, because biopsy itself already, uh, you all will already know that it's, uh, what, uh, that it's confirmed cancer. Is it necessary to do a PEP scan before, let's say if it's stage one, let's say, uh, and then surgery is required. Let's say they say that surgery can be done. Is it necessary to do the PEP scan? We will recommend the PEP scan and brain scan if, let's say, it's good because normally when uh, you get lung cancer, you, you might get brain uh, tumour. So probably the, the specialist feels that uh, it's good to do the PEP scan to make sure it doesn't spread elsewhere. And also the brain scan, then once and for they know what's happening and then they do the surgery since, since it's considered a very early stage. Okay, no, number one, you have to wait for a biopsy report. Right, so, um, uh, to confirm there is a lung cancer, right? So, after, if it's confirmed to be a lung cancer, I'm talking about if, uh, then, uh, then the next thing I need to know is a CT scan report. Now, sometimes if the CT scan show convincingly it's already metastatic, it's already spread to the bone, liver, then PET scan may not be necessary. But you mentioned that it's only 1.2 cm. I suspect that there isn't much else going on. So if there's no other lesion going on, uh, the PET scan is must. It's a must. So you must do a PET scan to stage um, your husband properly. Right? So if the PET scan is really clear, then actually he still also have to do an MRI brain. Okay, if there's also clear, if these two are clear, then we know that the cancer is only in this area, 1.2 cm. Then in a way, there's, there's already the best case scenario. Then the next person you need to see is Dr. Anand. <laughs> if, it, if it is not cancer, if it's cancer, then we know what we have to do. This too, okay, I understand that. But uh, at this point in time, actually, we refuse to do the PEP scan and the, the brain scan Unless we see, until we see the biopsy result, that is fine, right? I, I, I think that's fair enough. That, that is I, fair I, enough, I right? Because enough. I think PEP scan is very invasive. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it, because of the, the isotope, right? It's, it's quite invasive, right? So that's why we opt not to do the PEP scan and brain scan until after the biopsy. We rather wait an extra week, you know? Okay, let's say it's non, uh, you will probably be the one we do a second consultation. So uh, let's say this is not cancerous, right? I was told that the, 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 the growth is very near the artery. That's why when they did the biopsy, they could see the sign of some bleeding, but of course it stopped. Um, surgery, I would think that I would want the surgery to be done because since it's growing, I do not know whether it has grown from the last... Uh, they did this iodine scan, uh, you know, UMNC did the, the scan that iodine goes through. Uh, they, they didn't do the CT scan, they do that. I don't know what is it called, uh, what kind of scan that is. Surgery should also be done, right, to prevent, you know, to make sure that this thing doesn't grow. Because I've known people who, who don't have, uh, it's not cancer, but it's actually, it grows very big. I mean, that's a very good point you have raised, just for clarification. So a biopsy is done to get what we call as histological confirmation. It's what Dr. Chua is saying, to know yes or no if this growth is cancerous or not. But, you know, it's like scans. It's not perfect. Um, you can have a tumor or a mass. It may not be homogeneous, meaning there may not be cancer cells throughout. And the doctor, who is usually a radiologist who does the biopsy, with the best intention, will take a sample of tissue. So you can sometimes have what is called as a sampling error. You can get a, the pathologist can only report based on the sample of tissue that he or she receives. And the, even with all the CT and PET guidance, a biopsy, of course, if it comes back confirming lung cancer, be it in your husband's case or in any case, then we know for sure. 
sometimes we get a negative result. Uh, of course, the patient is happy, the doctor is happy, we're all happy, but if our clinical suspicion is high, uh, you know, they have a history of smoking or the ethnicity or the features on the CT scan, usually something that is cancerous has a speculated, that means that it's a jagged edge, as opposed to well circumscribed, where it's very smooth. Then these are certain features that suggest it is more likely to be cancerous than not. If it's very calcified, if it's very well-rounded, well-circumscribed, then it's less likely to be cancerous. But, um, so if you get a biopsy that is negative um, and it doesn't look too suspicious, at the minimum, he will need surveillance, which means a close follow-up scan, maybe at an interval of about three or four months, no later than that. Because sometimes you can have a slow-growing cancer Sometimes the biopsy can be falsely negative, inconclusive, what we call as a sampling error. Um, the PET scan, not just in your husband's case, but in any case, provides, as Dr. Chua said earlier, it provides uh, functional metabolic information. It doesn't tell us what that thing is. We usually know by that point what the nod We want to stage the disease. We need to know whether, okay, the person has something in the top of their right lung, and it can be removed, but Surgery is not appropriate, for example, if it is spread elsewhere. It is pointless if they're stage 3B, stage 4. So the PET scan is staging information to look for the extent of spread. And actually, it is not invasive in the sense that they put a drip in your hand. Yes, they do have to inject a radioactive isotope called FDG, fluorodeoxyglucose. But this is the standard of care across the world. This is the correct investigation. So I think in his case, as Dr. Chua was saying, the first thing is get the black and white report of the confirmation or hopefully exclusion of lung cancer. A negative result doesn't necessarily mean he hasn't got it, um, but it may be reasonable to watch very closely. I think um, in this scenario, a PET scan may be helpful, okay? But you have to bear in mind that there are uh, not all lung cancers light up on a PET scan. And there are non-cancers that can light up as well, one of those being TB. So infection, inflammation can also light up and give what is known as a false positive. So it's like being a detective in trying to work out what is happening. Um, another thing which neither of us mentioned in our talks, um, which is now being used is serum biomarkers, blood markers, a panel of tumor markers. But um, it is, probably still not good enough yet as a screening tool. But for patients who have confirmed lung cancer and undergo surgery or the advanced stage cases where they go for chemo or radio, it is very useful to monitor for disease recurrence or to monitor a response to treatment. I mean, our hope is that over time, uh, they will become good enough that one day you can just do a blood test. There's research being done around the world looking at what is called as volatile organic compounds. They say that uh, with the exhaled breath, what we blow out, each of us, they can analyze and it's predictive for the likelihood of having a lung cancer. So that is all in the future. But the standard workup is definitely an x-ray, a CT scan, a biopsy, which he's had. Wait for that result. If the suspicion is high, we don't want to waste time. They will be recommending a PET scan at the same time. An MRI brain, to be honest, we follow international guidelines. Um, for larger tumors, for high-risk patients, uh, an MRI brain is mandatory or if clinically indicated. That means if the person is having behavioral changes or anything that you think may be suspicious of underlying brain metastases. But for early stage small tumors, still the uh, international guidelines would say um, we work in the real world. There's a cost issue, there's a time issue. Uh, if you have early stage disease, the PET scan doesn't show disease elsewhere, it's fit enough, it's reasonable for a small tumor on the basis of that to go ahead and remove. But we need, uh, so what I'm trying to emphasize is a negative biopsy result is good, but it doesn't mean that that person hasn't necessarily uh, not got a ca lung cancer. Uh, I'm Eddie from KL. Uh, similar question. When you detected a stage one uh, cancer, uh, is it surgery is the only uh, solution or there are other treatment to, to stage one uh, cancer? Basically, uh, what I heard, there's also treatment like radio surgery. And what is the difference between the survival period of uh, going through the operation and this radio surgery? 
Thank you. Okay, that's a, a very good question. Um, the short answer is there are other available treatments. Uh, early stage, stage one, 1A, one 1B, one 2A, two 2B, two um, still the, the, the best treatment option if the patient is, if that person is fit enough, is surgery. Whether it's conventional open surgery or keyhole surgery, it is to remove that part of the lung. And uh, it has been shown to give the best chance of long-term survival, the best chance of a cure. But as I said previously, not everybody may be fit for an operation. Occasionally, we get someone who is, it's a resectable, that means we can remove the tumor, but they are not operable, meaning they're not fit enough. For example, they have a severe, uh, they have COPD or bad lung disease, they have end-stage renal failure. Or we may get a, a scenario where that person, that patient, doesn't want to have an operation. So of course, we respect the patient's wishes. So then you go for second best. And the options here are RFA, radiofrequency ablation, or something called SBRT. So the term radiosurgery is a misnomer. It's not actually surgery in the way of an operation, but they will put a probe in, similar to doing a biopsy, and try and burn or fry the tumor, coagulate it with an energy device, or similarly with SBRT, some form of targeted radiotherapy. Um, this is usually only recommended or offered for those who are medically not fit. If they are thought to be too high a risk for an operation or for the person who refuses to have surgery. But the results are, I don't have the exact figures off the top of my head, but they are nowhere as good as removing it. The, one of the disadvantages with uh, the non-surgical treatments is you don't know if you've rem killed all the cancer cells. And when you burn or ablate that, uh, when you do a follow-up scan, you get a lot of scarring and fibrosis. And then if you do a PET scan, that also lights up. So it can also confuse the picture. And you're not sure, the doctors are not sure then, is, it, is the tumor fully eradicated? Or is it a local recurrence? Is it still there? Are the tumor cells still viable? Whereas with surgery, you remove it completely. And you know if it's completely removed or not. The other thing we do in surgery is we do what is known as systematic lymph node dissection. We clear all the lymph nodes. And that is very important for the up or down staging of the patient in terms of whether they need uh, adjuvant therapy, the chemo or radio immunotherapy after successful surgery. The downside with surgery is it is an operation. So that person must be fit enough for general anesthesia and have enough what we call as pulmonary reserve. So I need to know if I remove half or one third of his or her lung, they have sufficient lung capacity to have a reasonably good quality of life thereafter. But the short answer is still the gold standard is operation to remove it if it's early stage, unless they are medically not fit or they refuse an operation. Then we go for second best, RFA or cyber knife or SBRT. Okay, good afternoon. My name is Michael from PJ. So I have come across uh, some uh, academic research by universities in Australia, India, and also in Malaysia regarding the use of uh, things like extra virgin coconut oil to induce apoptosis of cancer cells. So I want to hear your comments on this. Thank you. It's not recognized in, uh, in uh, uh, all this evidence-based medicine. Right, so uh, with this, I can only uh, counter offer you say, look, I refer to guidelines. Right, I can refer you to uh, the one I use is the NCCN guideline, National Comprehensive Cancer Network guideline. It's not inside there. I, I mean, I'll just add to that. Okay, at the end of the day, we live in the real world, and we encounter patients. A lot of my patients are Chinese patients. We all have cultural uh, beliefs or myths. For instance, after surgery, a lot of Chinese patients say to me they're told they're not supposed to eat egg because it affects wound healing. So if you have certain beliefs, fair enough, that's okay, as long as it's not something that is adverse. If you're going to take any complementary traditional treatments, you must let the doctors know because it can interact with the, uh, what treatments are offered. But as what Dr. Chua says, we practice and that's what doctors are trained to do is scientific evidence-based treatment. So we tend to adhere to the guidelines because we must be able to justify anything we do, be it surgery, chemo, radiotherapy, there are benefits and risks. And one thing that we see in Malaysia, uh, one of the concerns with late stage presentation is people go off and try alternative treatments. We don't know enough about it, whether it works or it doesn't. There may be a role for some of that, complementing conventional medicine but they may go off with a one or two centimeter tumor and come back six months later and it's huge and it's spread and nothing can be done. 
So we adhere to what is evidence-based treatment in, and, and proven treatments. There are side effects, there are risks, there are toxicities, but that is all discussed with, with the patient and the families. I'm Mary Thomas. Um, in 2017, I was diagnosed with stage 2A lung cancer. Subsequently, I had my left lower lobe removed and um, I went through four rounds of chemo. I lately, just in March, early March, I went for my PET scan, all was clear. But now I'm coughing and I'm breathless. So um, should I go for some, I'm, I'm worried about the cough. Obviously, I understand your, your re I mean, uh, um, I would just suggest that you go back to the, the, the team of doctors who treat you, who treated you. I mean, this cough of references, right? Yes, I mean, you, you, I, can, I can't deny there's a possibility there's a recurrence of disease, but I can tell you that there's also so many other causes of, uh, of cough and breathlessness. I think you need a proper workout, okay, and maybe some treatment and see how things go, really. Uh, I think that's I'm all. Also, I mean. I'm also asthmatic. Mm, yeah, I mean, can be that. I mean, maybe your asthma is not treated well. So asthma is, is one of the so many other causes. Uh. So I, I, think, I think before, before you, you put yourself into this, uh, this area, you think uh, you to get yourself too worried, go, go back to the team of doctors. I'm sure they are very happy to, to work you up properly. Because uh, you have come a long way, you know, you are, you are one of those that success case. Right? We pick up, we pick up early, we clear your disease, and definitely this, you are the type of people that we, we like to work hard okay, to, 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 for you to do well. Uh, so go back to the team of doctors. Okay. I, will, I will just echo that. Uh, delighted to hear that you know, it's been picked up and you've undergone surgery and the treatment. The fact that your PET scan, you said in March, early March, so a few weeks ago, is clear, it's very reassuring. Um, not uncommon after chemotherapy or surgery, you know, it takes time to recover. So go back and see your primary team, but I'm sure you'll be fine. Thank you. Uh, my name is Simon Tan from KL. Okay, basically for the targeted therapy, you know, you go for the oral chemo, you take the drugs. If let's say after two years, you know, your PET scan, the final PET scan show that everything is clear, do we have to take the drugs for the rest of our life? Uh, another question is, all this oral chemo was so costly, like you mentioned. It's something like, you know, 30,000 for 30 tablets, one tablet a day. And nowadays, there are all these genetic drugs, which is three, 4,000. Is uh, effective? I mean, is there any well-known genetic drugs that is uh, good at the moment in the market? Right. Um, okay. First question. First. Uh, now, do uh, do you have to continue? Yes. Usually, right. This uh, targeted therapy, right. Once it started, once it works well, right. You have to take it until it fails. So well, until the, the time that it comes, they say when it's proven on scan to say that the disease has relapsed, has recurred, has co progressed, and then only then is a time to consider stopping the targeted therapy, right. So so that's first, first uh, the answer to your first question. You should have to continue. Right, then obviously the, if you continue, the next thing that comes in is cost, right, very common, right? So yes, it's very, it's very expensive. Right? You're talking about 30K for 30 tablets. Uh, you're probably talking about the newer generation of EGF or TKI, uh, right? Uh, so, uh, well, I mean, uh, when you say generic, now, um, personally, I'm not aware of a, a good generic brand in Malaysia. Some of my patients, yes, uh, they, they went for generic usually from overseas. Uh. Uh, for a certain country, uh, I've seen that. I've seen that. So, but but whether that's good enough for 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 the for the for the condition or not, I think it's really it's really up to individual la. I mean, you know, I obviously I, I say that look, no one can promise that the generic will work as well as uh, original, right? It's almost it's almost like arguing originals DVD and pirate pirated DVD, isn't it? So so you say I can watch the pirated DVD. Can right so so uh, but obviously no one can promise lah. So uh, then is it, uh, if my patient asks me this question, I say you have to decide on yourself whether you, you want to switch yourself over to a generic brand of this TK or not, right? So so that one I think doctors cannot answer. I mean uh, for for medical reason, medical uh, I'm not talking about. I'm, I would say continue with original. 
because it's proven, ma. it's proven, it's manufactured by the, by the company. So it, it will be, it definitely be better. La. But if you put in financial, social, and all these things, then it, I think it's, we'll take it case by case basis. That's the problem because it's so expensive, isn't it? Um, my question is regarding the uh, Somatom scanner. Now, uh, it is known as a dual source scanner. Can you explain what is meant by dual source? And uh, what is the cost of such a scan? Uh, my second question, uh, Dr. Anand, you know, in your interesting talk, you mentioned about uh, lobectomy and segmentectomy. I'm not quite clear as to the difference between the two because both involve partial removal of the lung. Uh, could you please elaborate on that? Sure. Uh, thank you. Good question. So maybe I'll take the second question first. Um, so we've got two lungs, right? And we have um, a total of 19 segments across the two lungs. They're called bronchopulmonary segments, where each, we have our main airway, which is the trachea, or in layman's terms, the windpipe. It divides into the right and left main bronchus. And like branches of a tree, it keeps dividing, supplying different segments of the lung. So we have a right lung with an upper lobe, a middle lobe, and a lower lobe. And we have a left lung with an upper lobe and a lower lobe. Um, so the right lung is a little bit bigger than the left lung. Three lobes on the right, two lobes on the left. Within each lobe, there are segments. So a segment has, it's what we call as an anatomical and functional subunit of the lung. It has its own small airway, its own blood supply, a branch of the pulmonary artery, the pulmonary vein. So our upper lobe is three segments. Our middle lobe on the right is two segments. The lower lobe has five segments. And on the left, upper lobe, there are four segments, and the lower lobe is five. So if you add it up, we have 19 segments in total. So again, if you have a lung cancer, and if it's localized, the gold standard uh, treatment or the operation of choice, the most proven for decades across the world, is a lobectomy. It's an anatomical resection where we remove that lobe, be it the upper, middle, or lower lobe, depending on where the tumor is. Sometimes we have to do a compromise operation in someone who say has poor lung function, with a lot of comorbidities, very elderly, poor heart function, etc. Then we may remove segment, which is a smaller resection, but ironically, it's technically even more difficult to do. But that comes at the price of an increased risk of uh, local recurrence. So the principle of the operation is to remove the tumor completely and do the lymph node dissection. And then depending on the the, the, what the pathologist reports, if the margins are clear, in other words, if the tumor is fully removed, then usually there's no need for radiotherapy. If the lymph nodes are involved with microscopic disease, then you may need adjuvant, chemo, or immuno or targeted therapy. Um, we used to do, in the past, pneumonectomies, where you have to remove an entire lung. So that could be a very big tumor, or a tumor that's crossing, going from one lobe to another, or a tumor that is very central, involving uh, uh, the major airway then the only way to remove it is to remove an entire lung, which is um, ironically, technically, in some ways, easier to do than a lobectomy, but a bigger operation for the patient and a higher risk. Uh, I mean, in terms of risk, a standard lobectomy carries a risk of about maybe 3 or 4% risk. That includes the risk of the patient's life and all the other things. A pneumonectomy is about double that, 7% to 8%. Um, your first question, I can't tell you about the dual source. That's a very technical thing that a radiographer and radiologist will be able to clarify. What I can tell you is that um, it is CT scans have been around for a long time. The low dose CT means without contrast. The radiation dose is exceedingly low. And the reason we don't need contrast, as I said in my talk, is to look at the lung tissue. We're not interested in the blood vessels. We're trying to pick up early stage disease within the spongy tissue, the parenchyma of the lung. And uh, the technology is good. It is uh, rapid acquisition, minimal radiation. Uh, a question we constantly get asked in the clinics is, you know, patients, and sometimes I find it quite, I wouldn't say amusing, but in fact, someone who's been smoking for years or someone who has proven lung cancer, and they are worried now about when we recommend another scan at a certain interval, which is fair enough. But um, there's been a study published a few years ago um, I think it was in the US, called the Cosmos Study, and they looked at people who had a low-dose CT scan every year for 10 years as part of the screening. 
and the likelihood of getting a cancer as a consequence of the regular scans was something like 0.05%. So it's very low. So out of 10,000 people who undergo an annual low-dose screening CT scan over 10 years consecutively, annually, five of those 10,000 people may get a radiation-induced cancer, which I can tell you statistically is very low. And the trade-off is they would pick up uh, so many more lung cancers at an early stage. So you can put that in perspective in terms of background radiation or how much, you know, um, how detrimental smoking is or other things. Uh, and the modern generation low-dose CT scan, they call them ultra-low-dose, the radiation dose is even less. The, do the dual source, I'm not sure, it's a technical thing. The dual source is actually the, how, how the machine collect data, right? Imagine the, when the CT scan is done, the patient is lying down. So the, 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 the source, right, the source of radiation is go one round. To, uh, to, 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 re uh, to gain all the information. Now, if you've got du dual source, it means that there are two, there are two scanners. So you only have to turn half around. So you end up with a shorter scanning time. So I've learned something too. <laughs> I have a very, the doctor, I have a very simple question. For the low dose uh, CT scan, can it detect uh, stage 1A lung cancer? That's the whole purpose of the low-dose CT scan. For someone uh, with uh, TB that mm. cured before, we would be able to detect it? Uh, good question. So, well, the whole purpose of screening is to pick it up early. And in the early stage, it'll be very, very small. Um, by the time you can see a lung cancer on a chest X-ray, it's too big. Or it has to be quite big, and often it means it's a more advanced stage. So. The technology is such very, very fine cross-sectional images that are reconstructed. So the short answer is yes. You can pick up a lung cancer, even in someone who's had TB that has been treated. Of course, the scan, it, the lung cancer is not going to have a flag waving saying I'm a lung cancer. So there will be certain features that are suggestive of a lung cancer, but TB, unfortunately, is one of those things that can mimic. So this is where the clinical judgment comes into play. Uh, if it is scarring or fibrosis due to previous TB, it'll be static. That means that nodule or that mass or shadow will be the same. So if it's a scan that is not convincing, the doctor will say, look, you will look at your clinical profile, your age, your ethnicity, your smoking history, your family history. We may even do the blood biomarkers to help stratify. If still we're none the wiser, the sensible approach, be judicious. They will say, look, we better see you in three or four months with a follow-up scan. The biology of the tumor varies from one to the other, the tumor doubling time. But a true cancer will, over time, change or get bigger, whereas a TB nodule or scarring will not. So sometimes that watchful waiting is necessary. It's anxiety for everybody, but there's no other way. Because if it's very small, a biopsy may be technically difficult or also less reliable. But yes, the short answer is low-dose CT scan can pick up an early stage 1A lung cancer, even in someone with a history of TB. Thank you very much, Dr. Anand and Dr. Chua, for attending to our audience's questions. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, we have come to the end of today's Star Live session. Once again, a big thank you and a round of applause to our doctors for taking the time to be part of this today's session. And thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for being part of this morning's session. We hope to see you again at the next Star Live session. Don't forget to pass us your feedback form as you exit. Have a great day.